got the first one. I, mean, I think you're going to be good to go at the third law. Challenge one, that's fine, right? Not a problem. Uh, I think Ruchi got like 1.036 or something like that. It seems like it's probably right. Now, I do have a couple other slides on Kepler's laws that I think I'd rather come back to next time. Because there's really nothing new, right? There's just going to be a couple little things that we um, make a little bit clearer, so I think we'll come back to those after our review for the test on Tuesday. Um, on my blog entry yesterday, um, I did put a review sheet uh, with projectile problems and questions and circular motion uh, problems and questions, right? So I put that there. I don't have all the answers yet. Um, I have the answers to just the very first problem. Um, if any of you have your heart set on at least getting that one answer for the weekend, let me know and I'll send that out. Otherwise, I'll probably wait till Monday when I have like all of them done. All right, so we'll, we'll pick, we'll do these last two slides of Kepler's Laws on Tuesday. Um, I do want to spend about 15 minutes talking about gravitation and then maybe even the last 15 minutes of class also, uh, but we'll see. So I did ask you when you came in, you know, what was the deal with me and the apple? Um, what did your foursome, like, remember about that, Janelle? Um, he was standing under a tree. He was standing under a tree and an apple fell and hit his head. All right. Um, Amanda, did your foursome think the same thing? Did you remember something a little different? Well, they just said that it was gravity that pulled the apple down. It was gravity that pulled the apple down. All right. Did anybody else have something else to add to what happened with Newton and the apple? Alright, so I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, what the heck did Newton do? Like, why is Newton important? Uh, and I don't know that it's exactly why we're led to believe it's important in like third and fourth grade when we study physical science. Uh, Newton did not discover gravity. He didn't name gravity. Um, gravity was known about, you know, I think probably since that guy was walking around. Who's that? Caveman. Yeah, it's like a caveman, right? So they like threw spears and stuff. They like make, uh, you know, game, like, run off of cliffs to, to be able to eat. I mean, they knew about gravity. They knew that things like that, um, they might, the cavemen might not have had a word for it, but certainly people before the late 1600s, when Newton was around, had a name for this gravity that made things fall. But what people didn't get was that this gravity that governs the motion of things on Earth uh, is also responsible to the motion of things off of Earth. Right, the motion of the moon orbiting the Earth. Right, we know today that it's gravity. It's gravity from the Earth that does that. But it, Newton, that was Newton's great insight. That gravity was what governed the motion of things on Earth and things up in the heavens. Right. So Newton did not invent gravity. Right, but he made that link of the force that pulls an apple to the ground. Right, it's the same thing as the force that accelerates the moon around the Earth. The same exact. And then he set out to try and explain this gravity. Uh, did he do a good job? No, no, actually he didn't. He didn't do a good job at all. Um, he tried and tried and tried, uh, invented calculus along the way to help him out in, in explaining this physics, but he actually failed um, pretty, pretty miserably. Right? He gave up eventually. He succeeded in describing how strong gravity was, but he failed in describing what the heck gravity was, right? And we actually still don't have a great model for what gravity is. We have some ideas, we have some theories, but gravity is kind of the one force that we really still don't have a firm grasp of. This discovery of the Higgs boson, right, that was announced a couple months ago, is a big piece of that, but we're still not all the way there. But anyway, we do want to look at what Newton did in terms of quantifying these gravitational pulls. So he found that the amount of gravity, the amount of pull between two objects only depended on three factors. Right? First of all, I, I just want to again restate that when we're talking about gravity, there's got to be two objects, right? Earth and apple, right? Or earth and moon. Right? There's 
got to be two things that are mutually pulling on each other. All right, so the three factors that this gravitational force depends on is, first of all, how massive the two things are that are pulling on each other. If they are more massive, the pull will be stronger, right? So the moon and the earth at a given distance would pull on each other much stronger than the apple and the earth because the moon is way more massive than an apple. The other thing that is of profound importance is how far apart the objects are. Right? And when we're talking about big objects like the Earth, we kind of simplify the situation and pretend that all of the mass of the big thing is right at its center. Right? So if we really are talking about an apple that's just you know, essentially at the Earth's surface, the distance between them would be not the distance between the apple and the ground, but the distance between the apple and the center of the Earth. And that actually works out just fine. Um, unless we kind of tunnel into the Earth, then it gets kind of complicated. Right? So those three things are, are the only factors that influence how much gravity there is. Right? And, and, and here is Newton's law of universal gravitation. Right? We have uh, F for force, uppercase G, which stands for gravitation. We have our three factors that we just talked about, right? M1 and M2, would be the mass of the two things that are pulling on each other. I hope this isn't too confusing. But R is the distance between the two masses. It doesn't actually stand for radius in this case. And then I'm, I'm doing a bad job at covering up this other thing that's there, right? Because Newton didn't understand gravity and he wasn't able to just have a physical law. He needed a fudge factor to make his math work, right? So we have a fudge factor in there. We call it, we give it a fancy name so it sounds nice, the universal gravitation constant. But it's just a fudge factor, it's just a number that makes the math work. And whenever we have that, it kind of shows that, well, maybe we don't really understand the math. If we don't have an equation that's all physical things that we can measure, we really don't understand it. Um, so anyway, the, this fudge factor is a ridiculously small value, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And that is on your equation sheet, you don't have to like memorize that. Let me do a, a pause and ask what questions we have so far about the terms that show up in our equation that, that will calculate for us how much of a pool two things exert on each other. All right, the other thing I'd like to say here is that this F big G is precisely the same thing as F little g. These are two different ways of talking about the exact same force, right? Weight, which is how strong the Earth is pulling on me, Right? Same thing as this. This is also how strong the Earth is pulling on it. If we know acceleration due to gravity, we're always going to use this. But if we don't know acceleration due to gravity, that's when we're going to have to use this other one. But the two forces are, are precisely the same thing. All right. So let's go ahead and, and, and you know, solve a problem with this. And then um, I'd like to jump ahead and talk a little bit about some semi-quantitative questions that you'll, you're likely to encounter about this equation. All right, so let's take a look at this Saturn. Right, we get some information about Saturn, its radius. When I say Saturn has a radius, right, I'm not saying it's its orbital radius. That's not how far it is from the sun. But that's the actual radius of the sphere that we call Saturn. Right? So Saturn has a radius of that. And Saturn's pretty fat. Right? It's way more massive than the Earth. So there's its mass. Um, we put Anna on the surface of Saturn, right? She's not so fat, 54 kilograms. How much does she weigh on Saturn? So previously, we would say, oh, yeah, we're looking for the weight. We can do mass times acceleration due to gravity. But we can't use 9.81 because we're not at the surface of the Earth, right? So we can't use that equation. But we can't, we do have enough information to use our new equation. <coughs> All right, so we'll draw a picture, right? Identify our variables, and then try and find our, uh, our unknown. All right, so I actually already drew my picture. Look, there it is, right? Here's Saturn, here's Anna. Um, what information do we have? We have the radius of Saturn, which is how far apart those two things are. So 6.03 times 10 to the 7. We also know one of our, well, we know both of our masses, right? M1, I'm going to call Saturn. If you prefer, you can call it M2. It makes no difference. And then Anna, we know her mass. 
Uh, we are looking for her weight. I'm going to call that F capital G. If you call it F lowercase g, whatever, it's the same thing. And then this universal gravitation constant right, is something we're also going to need to use. All right, so I have step one over there, step two, step three. I'll write my equation, and then I'll pause and see if we have any, any questions. Sometimes these masses are called one and two. Sometimes they're called A and B, like whatever. Same thing. All right, questions from anybody about my first four steps so far? All right, well, not a whole lot of complexity here. Uh, we have our 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. All right, and then we have a really big number that we're multiplying with that. And we have our 54 kilograms. And we do need to make sure that we square this distance. That's why distance is actually a more important term than the masses, because the distance does get squared. Alright, so why don't you go ahead and get about that value on your calculator. I'll do it on mine. Whenever we have scientific notation, we have to give a little bit of extra care putting, putting things in. Oh boy, how many significant digits? Two, right? Two significant digits. If you get something way larger than that, then you probably forgot to square your distance. All right, so let me give a minute for you guys to finish that up, and then we'll, we'll do a final comment about that value as well. Raise your hand if you're done already. Uh, there's a few of you done. Could, could you go ahead and find what her weight is on Earth? Right, just using our regular weight equation. Um, it, again, if you're getting something way bigger, you're forgetting to square your de denominator. If you're just getting it wrong, I, I think it, it must just be the way you're entering scientific notation. I can help you with that in a few minutes. Ah! Alright, so let me do one final comment on Anna, and then we'll, we'll think about what we want to do in our last 20 minutes together. Uh, on Saturn, right, Anna has a weight of 560 newtons. On Earth, she doesn't, she doesn't weigh much less than that. Right, Will is telling me 530 newtons. Michael, Priyanchi, anybody else? Yep, same thing. So she's barely heavier on Saturn than she is on Earth, but I thought Saturn was immense. Right? Isn't Saturn, like, immense compared to the Earth? Ben? Well, isn't Saturn made up of a bunch of gas? Uh, it's called a gas giant. All right. So what? More volume, less mass. Right. So it is way more massive, but it's also way less dense. So it has more mass, but that mass is way like spread out. So not only so this term is way bigger, but this term is way, way, way bigger. They almost perfectly balance each other out to give her the same weight as on Earth. So that's kind of interesting. Even though Saturn is like way, way fatter than the Earth, it's also way less dense. So things weigh about the same. I think acceleration due to gravity is like 10.2 meters per second squared. If you could stand on the surface of Saturn, you can't. Because, like Ben says, it's kind of like a gas. Um, but if you were there, you would barely weigh more than on Earth. Kind of interesting. Um, other issues with this first example of using the law of universal gravitation. All right. Uh, what we, so I, I actually want to reserve about 15 minutes. Uh, I think we'll skip this one. Uh, let me reiterate this. So this is our first example of something that's called like an inverse square relationship. We're going to encounter quite a few inverse square relationships in physics. I suppose this year we're only going to encounter like one other. No, we'll encounter two others actually. So what does this mean? So we have an inverse square relationship between force and distance in this case, right? So it's inverse because distance is in the denominator here. And then it's square because the distance is square. So we often hear about inverse square relationships. That's all that we're talking about, right? And we want to get a little bit comfortable um, manipulating 
inverse square relationships. So I'd like to kind of step back from just you know using the equation and using our calculators to looking at what happens if we just manipulate one of these variables. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of erasing, but I just want to have two generic masses that are pulling on each other gravitationally, right? They're, they're exerting some force on each other based on their mass, right? Based on how far apart they are. But then I want to change something and see how adept we are at predicting precisely what that change would do to how strongly they're pulling on each other. Right, so we're doing like six totally separate things. Consider these six separate questions. Um, let's kind of do the first one together, and then maybe I'll have you talk the rest out in your groups. I should not have erased the law of universal gravitation, sorry. Alright, so again, originally we have the two masses, they're some distance apart, and then all of a sudden we double one of the masses. So instead of like M and M, we have like M and 2M. We double the mass, we keep the distance alone. If we're doubling something that's in the numerator, then that should serve to double um, right, our force. That should serve to double the thing over here. So doubling one of the masses should end up giving us twice as much force. Right? So we don't want to just say that the attraction increases. We want to say it increases by a factor of two. Can you guys take you know, a minute, two minutes um, in your foursomes and see if you can find the effect that each of these other five things would do to the, to the force as well? And maybe we don't need a whole lot of talk for me about this. Let's see. Come on. So then the force should be the same. Alright? Who's next? This one? 
uh, the masses are twice as far apart. So we're back to both having like the original amount of mass, but we move them twice as far apart. This is where that inverse square relationship is very, very, very important. Because if we double how far apart they are, the force is certainly going to get weaker, but it's going to get more, it's going to get even weaker than half as weak, right? Doubling this, we have to square that doubling effect, and the force should be like four times weaker, or you could say one-fourth the original force that we have. All right, so we have to heave that inverse square law. Here, if the masses are four times further apart, we should have one-sixteenth the amount of force that we originally had. And here, the distance between the masses reduces to one-third, so we'll have a stronger force, and we do have to square that one-third effect, right? If we square one-third, I think we get one-ninth. But if we have a one-ninth in the denominator, that means this should be nine times bigger, right? Nine times bigger. Now, if you have a hard time with this, if this gives you a headache, like when you try and kind of do this in your head, let me show you a pretty foolproof way to do it. If you're happy with this, go ahead and look at the questions I gave out. Right? You don't even have to listen. But if you're not quite happy, let me show you a better way to do this. You can, in, and I'm going I'm to do, uh, I'll do this one right here. Invent easy numbers to use. All right? So I'm actually going to assign values to this stuff. I'm going to say M1 originally is one kilogram. M2 will also originally be one kilogram. And then I'm going to put them exactly one meter apart. And I'm going to calculate the force with those values that I just dreamt up. So the force would be whatever the heck big G is, I'm not even going to put the value in, times 1 times 1 divided by 1 squared. So originally I get a force of exactly G. And now I'm going to alter the values in the way that we're saying. So one of the mass doubles. So instead of 1 kilogram, we have 2 kilograms. The other mass cuts in half. Instead of 1 kilogram, we'll have a half a kilogram. The distance didn't change at all, that's still one meter, right? So now, I'll do big G times two, right? That's my new first mass, times a half, that's my new second mass, and still divided by one squared. And I still end up with G, right? That doesn't take that long to do. Uh, it took me about a minute, right, to, to do that. Um, if you need to do that, that's fine. You can pretty much count on having questions similar to this, like on our test next week, and on your midterm as well. So if, it, if it's going to cost you an extra three minutes for the test, I think it's worth it to know that you're going to get those right. Um, so we still have about ten minutes. Now yesterday I actually had a meeting, and I had to leave my other class like before we were at this stage. Um, so I made this thing for, for them um, to, to do while I was gone. Um, I'm not going to make you do this, but these are you know, pretty good questions that involve gravitation and circular motion, actually, for about the last half. Um, so I'm just going to let you have this. You can consider it a study tool if you want. I do have answers. Um, if you would prefer, actually, yeah, so that's what, I, that's what I'm going to ask you to do in our last 10 minutes. Um, let me put answers on the board, but I'm going to wait about six or seven minutes before I do that. Um, I think it might make sense to do these by yourself. Uh, to kind of test yourself with, hey, can you actually do this? A bunch of the questions are doing things like this. But if you have your heart zone working um, with your neighbor or somebody else in your force, then that's fine. All right? If I forget about putting answers on the board in six or seven minutes, please remind me because I would like you to be able to check your work.